As we mentioned last week, it was Reformation Sunday, which is celebrated once a year to remember the great sea change that took place in history when Martin Luther and uh, several other so-called reformers rediscovered uh, the clear gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, which had been buried for uh, centuries by the uh, medieval Dark Age Church. When they discovered this experience of being forgiven freely uh, by faith alone, through the grace of God, uh, it uh, was a move of God by his spirit across Europe and uh, England and uh, other parts of the world that transformed society, took us out of the Dark Ages. Now, some secular historians credit the Renaissance or the rediscovery of learning, which happened around the same time, but the two actually work together, and without the uh, printing press and the uh, uh, spread of the gospel message, uh, the Renaissance probably would not have even happened with all its learning. Uh, but the uh, wonderful uh, experience of millions of people uh, throughout Europe <clears throat> uh, during that uh, 16th century, the 1500s, uh, God moved and worked and it was a real revival. It was the mercy of God to restore us back to uh, the great message. And that message was um, begun in the Old Testament by Habakkuk as the scripture was read about his praising God. Uh, Habakkuk was an interesting person. We talked about him last week. He was a prophet in the Old Testament, and uh, he lived at a time of terrible declension, uh, immorality, idolatry, all kinds of horrible things were going on among God's people in Judah, in Judea, and around the area of Jerusalem the, where the temple was. And the things had gone really bad. It uh, sort of reminds us of today. But uh, Habakkuk was in despair over the, uh, the, the, the repression, the dishonesty, the corruption, the immorality, the violence, all these awful things were going on. It seemed like God had abandoned Israel. So Habakkuk cried out to God and God answered him and said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to chastise my people. I'm going to correct them. I'm going to punish them for their uh, lawlessness and their sin. And uh, Habakkuk figured, well, okay, that makes sense. But then, he, then God said something that surprised him. And he said, I'm going to use the Babylonians, the, this horrible people, these cruel people who were much worse than Israel. And Habakkuk couldn't quite get his head around that. He said, uh, you know, how can you use bad people to uh, beat up people that aren't that bad? And, and God said, well, you just be quiet and listen and uh, be still and wait and see what I do. And uh, so while he went through some turmoil in his heart, Habakkuk then came to the conclusion that was read in the scripture that no matter what happened, no matter how bad things got, he would rejoice in the Lord. He would rejoice in God. Why? Because he trusted him and believed that he was good and he could only do good no matter how bad things got. That was a, it was a revolution and a revelation in his life as a person. So we had the scripture read, uh, though the, there's no, uh, uh, no uh, nothing's growing, uh, there's famine, there's a lack of uh, uh, cattle and this and that and all these terrible things. He said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will uh, praise him and so forth. So th this is a key. Now, the, the, the foundation of that spirit in Habakkuk, that ability to look beyond all the circumstances and have a peace and a joy in his heart, no matter what was going on around him, that came from a, a, a statement that God made to him. And that statement was, no matter how bad things get, the just 
shall have life for his faith. Doesn't matter how many people have to die and kill each other and all this. He says the just shall have life for his faith. And then he, he, he discovered that faith and he rejoiced in God in the midst of terrible circumstances. That's the point of the message today. The point of the message today is living faith. A living faith. That means a faith that helps us know how to live. Uh, faith is not some ethereal, empty, uh, hope so, wish thinking. No, faith is a solid power that God puts in the human heart of knowing. It's a knowledge, it's a faith knowledge. It's knowing in our hearts something that maybe the world can't see, has no idea about, or I don't even understand. But in my heart, I have a peace that surpasses human comprehension. That's what the Bible offers. That's what it says. So we're going to look at that today. The first thing we see is that salvation, eternal salvation, is all important, all important. When it comes time to die, all that matters is that you have eternal salvation. Now, when we talk about eternal salvation, the world says, oh, that's, that's religious talk. We don't know what that means. It means, well, maybe you don't want to go to hell or something. Uh, you know, the world just has no clue about the reality of eternal salvation. The Bible says every individual, no matter what they get, they can gain the whole world. But if they lose their soul, if they don't have eternal salvation, and, and you know, Everybody's got to die. He said, I don't want to think about it. No, we don't want to think about it, and we shouldn't dwell on it. We want to live, and we want to have, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, you might have it more abundantly. We're not going to run around worrying about dying. But the only way to really avoid any even unconscious fear of death is to know you have eternal salvation. And the Bible says, these things have I written unto you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that's faith, who believe in the name, his power, who he is, what he claimed, what he did, in the Son of God, you may know, K-N-O-W, very strong Greek word, know for sure that you now possess eternal life, eternal salvation. Jesus went on and on saying, those who believe in me will never die. The, the, the Pharisees couldn't grasp it. They just didn't, couldn't make any sense of it. You'll never die. You'll live forever. You'll have eternal life. He kept pounding that Jesus was otherworldly. You see, we like to say, well, he was a good man and he wanted to make a better world and he wanted to make people better. No, that's all part of it. They're byproducts. The fact is he came to seek and to save that which was lost, eternal salvation. We're not ashamed of it. We don't uh, ignore it. We don't minimize it. We maximize it because it's all important. And uh, people just don't want to think about it because... It, talk, it makes you think about dying, and nobody wants to think about that. Two aspects of our eternal salvation. One, something that happened in heaven. Two, something that happens continually in us. What happened in heaven is God, the Creator God, has made provision so that He can pronounce the sinner forgiven that the judge, the just judge, can look at the guilty sinner and say, I pronounce you pardoned, forgiven, free from the consequences of your sin, which is eternal death. God does that in heaven. God does it. It doesn't happen here. It happens up there. It's in the heart and mind of God. He looks down. He looks, uh, Jesus said, his eyes run to and fro. The Lord said he looks into the hearts of individuals. And when he sees a heart that turns to him, when they hear his message of love and forgiveness, the heart turns to him. God bestows upon them his own perfect righteousness. 
His righteousness, not ours, you see. Now that's where we come in in Jeremiah, believe it or not, way back, twice in Jeremiah. He says, there's going to come a day. Uh, we read, uh, Chris read some, something from Jeremiah about the new covenant. In, it, it wasn't the same scripture, but same thought. God says in Jeremiah, he says, I'm going to raise up someone like David, my servant David. And of course, he's talking about the Christ, the eternal Christ, Jesus. I'm going to raise him up. And the mark of his coming is going to be the Lord, our righteousness. That's the, that's the key. The key is the Lord, our righteousness, not my righteousness. I can't ever in a thousand lifetimes produce enough quality of righteousness to be perfect and get into heaven. It just can't happen. It's too late. But he gives us his own righteousness and he spells it out. He says, he who knew no sin, Christ, perfect, the Lamb of God without spot or blemish. He who knew no sin was made our sin on the cross. He, was, he took all our sin on the cross that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So today, if you're trusting Christ as your savior, you have something in connection with heaven. God in heaven has pronounced you righteous with his righteousness. Now, the second part of it is something happens here on earth. And if it doesn't happen here on earth, then you've never been pronounced righteous in heaven. But if you've been pronounced righteous in heaven by the grace and mercy of God because you've thrown yourself on his mercy and trusted him with all your heart, quit defending, depending on your own good works or anything you didn't do or did do or what you forget all, you trust him alone. He said, if that's the case and he pronounces you righteous, something's gonna happen here. And what happens is he puts his own spirit eternal spirit, eternal life just comes in and covers your spirit and you are reborn with eternal life. That's eternal salvation. So there's the heavenly aspects, there's the earthly aspect. In heaven, it's once and for all settled. On earth, it takes the rest of your life, little by little, to begin to live up to that righteousness. Lots of fits and starts and failures, but moving ever in the right direction of becoming more and more like Jesus. That's the proof, that's the evidence the life begins to change. Never reaches perfection. Now, two things the Apostle Paul said. He said, even at the end of his life, he said, I have not attained, attained. Now, obtain is to take something that's given to you, you obtain it, attaining it is earning it and deserving it. He said, I haven't attained, I haven't attained, but I have obtained. I've obtained the mercy, the mercy and grace and righteousness of God. He said, and, and here's, and I want to, I need to read that to you, it's in Philippians. Uh, uh, and Paul writes this as his own personal testimony. And here's what he says, he says, Doubtless, first of all, doubtless, he says, I'm saying this without a doubt. This is absolutely sure, I'm positive about this. This is, I'm sure about this, get this. Paul is writing to the Philippians, doubtless. He says, I count everything to be nothing but worth losing for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Here's a man who killed Christians, hounded them, hunted them. God transformed him, showed him the truth. He was reborn. And now all he cares about is the love of Christ. In another place, he says, he says, he loved me. 
and gave himself for me. Paul said he loved me and gave himself for me. He takes it personally and you take it personally. That's why I believe in personal salvation as an individual. And then he says, the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, my master, I'm like a slave. He's the master. My whole life is his. Whatever he says, I do. Whatever he says, don't do, I don't do. That's Paul. He says, Jesus, my Lord, not just my Savior, my Lord. And then he says, for whom I have allowed the loss of everything. He said, I gave up career. I might have wound up high priest. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was a scholar. I was trained by the Greeks. I was trained by the Jews, by the greatest Jew teacher in Israel, Gamaliel. I sat at his feet. I was famous. He said, it's gone. I want nothing to do with it. He says, all things, I count them but refuse, dung, that I may win Christ. And what by that he means to become like him. And then he says this, and here's the key. He says, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God in heaven, his righteousness by faith. You can't, you can't make it any clearer. Paul spells it out all the way through the New Testament as do the other writers. We are justified by faith. Now, that's, that's, that's vital. But the point we're making today is this, that that faith, once we come to Christ, should sustain us and strengthen us and help us to get through every single day with victory. Now, victory is not some end of the battle. Victory is just not getting defeated by the world and by your own weaknesses and flesh and fears and anxieties and uh, and hostilities and envy and jealousy and lust and pride. These are the things that defeat your life. And we want victory in that area, in our hearts, in our minds. That's where the battle is. The battle's in the mind and the heart, and we can have victory. Many years ago, I was a student in college and I worked in a supermarket part-time, went to school in the daytime, worked in the evenings and bagged groceries. And I bagged groceries and of course there was a cashier and I'm standing there, you know, you go to the supermarket and there's the cashier, she takes your money and there's somebody there to put your groceries in a bag. Well, that was the bagger. So I'm there bagging for Fern. Her name was Fern. She was from Mountain City, Tennessee. It was amazing because everybody was from Mountain City. You'd think it was the size of New York. It was just a crossroads, but everybody wanted to be from Mountain City. Well, she was really from Mountain City, so she was a Southern girl, and she was tough. And people used to give her some grief once in a while, and I said, Fern, how come you're so calm? She says, well, I just add $5 to their bill and don't care. <laughs> she was tough. But after a while, a few years later, I was a pastor. And I got a call, the fern was in the hospital. She had cancer, breast cancer. So I went to see her, I could see her now, she's laying there. And uh, I said, how you doing, fern? And she says, well, it may kill me, but it ain't gonna scare me to death. How about that? I'll never forgot it. She says, this stuff may kill me, but it ain't gonna scare me to death. She had peace, why? Because she had found the Lord. She had joined a church, she got baptized, she became a Christian, I don't think I had anything to do with it, but it happened. And then when she got this problem, and she survived it and lived many years after, but I'll never forget, she's laying there, she didn't know whether she was gonna live or die, and she said, it may kill me, but it ain't gonna scare me to death. And I thought to myself, boy, that, that's victory. Because she was not afraid at all. She was trusting the Lord. 
That's the victory. The Bible says that this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So the word of God tells us that the faith that comes to our hearts when God justifies us in heaven and gives us his righteousness and then his Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we've been forgiven, that can become so powerful, so important, so vital, so current in our minds and lives that it stands as a bulwark against all the fears and, and, and the antagonisms and the corruptions and all the failures, our own failures. It stands against all those things so we can have uh, victory in Christ, victory. You know, um, one of the problems that people have today, and I think this is across the board, for those who don't know the Lord, they, they have to live a life of compensating for their sin. If they don't know how to get their sin blotted out and forgiven and taken away totally and made pure and righteous in the sight of God and accepted by his mercy and grace, if they don't experience that, that they have to deal with guilt. And uh, people, don't, people don't love righteousness by nature. They want to be good enough not to get punished. Like Luther said, uh, people are righteous for two reasons. One, fear of punishment. Two, uh, pride of achievement. Uh, that's why they're, that's the only reasons why they're righteous. They, that's their motive. They, they don't have a deeper motive. They don't know the Lord. They don't know the joy of feeling like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm right with God by his mercy and, and I don't have to worry about that. See, there's two beautiful verses, and there are, one is chapter 5 of Romans, uh, verse 1, and one is chapter 8, verse 1, and chapter 5 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Romans 8 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, then it says, in, then Romans 8 says, uh, there is therefore, another therefore, no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. So why do you condemn yourself? Well, I fail, but he doesn't condemn you. He, he'll correct you. He'll, 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 he'll work with you. But he did, no condemnation, no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Condemnation is not part of the vocabulary with God anymore for a Christian. You're redeemed, washed in the blood, no condemnation. So you want to deal with your sin? You fail, you ask for forgiveness, you take the promise. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We claim the promise and move on. And that's what God wants us to do not dwell on our failures, which can just keep us from going forward. But the point is people don't want righteousness if they don't know the Lord. They just want to be good enough not to get punished. They want to get by, and that's, that's human nature. Now, the thing is that if they, they, they don't want rights, they want to get rid of their guilt, guilt feelings, because everybody's got them. They spend millions, billions on therapists and pills and booze and dope and uh, distractions to try to somehow get rid of the unconscious, maybe deep down inside sense of guilt. I heard of a, a famous movie actor who said, you know, I do something bad, I feel guilty. He says, but then I do something good, I still feel guilty. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. If you want to see some of the most beautiful cherry trees in the world, beautiful, bright cherry trees, they're at a hospital in Maryland. They're there because some guy was so grateful that they took him as a patient and helped him through some rough times that he donated these beautiful cherry trees back in the, in the last century, back in the early part of the last century.
pre-1950, back in the 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, he gave these beautiful trees. Some of them died, now they're all over the place. Beautiful. Well, this guy uh, lived in Chicago, and in those days, he was making $100 million a year. A hundred million, that's like, a, that's like billions today. And um, he did it by saying, well, I'm just serving the people and I'm giving them what they want. Well, how he was serving them was, of course, he was giving them bootleg booze, prostitution, gambling, and all kinds of racketeering. And he was doing all this stuff. In the process, he worked in a brothel and got syphilis, went to this hospital. They were the only hospital that would take him. So out of gratitude, he gave him the cherry trees. The cherry trees are still there. He's long gone. His name was Alfonso Gabriel Capone. At 26, he was ruling Chicago. And he was responsible, they say, for at least 700 murders. Okay, now, here's the thing about him. While he was in the business running Chicago, he spent $2,500 a day back in those days for soup kitchens for everybody because it was a depression. So he fed the whole fed the city, bought a dairy so he could have to give milk to the children. What's the point of all this? You know, even if you do righteous things, it doesn't take away from the evil things. The righteous things don't cleanse the evil things. It just doesn't work that way. But that's the way the world sees it. So you see, God says, no, that doesn't work. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Why? Because we're motivated either by the pride of achievement or fear of punishment. That's the way it is. So there's only one solution. And Capone never found it. He died in babbling like an idiot, he lost his mind, the syphilis got to his head, and uh, he died at 38 or 40 years old or something, and the, the only way they could catch him for all his crimes was tax evasion. He went to jail for a while and got so bad they had to let him out. Tragedy, tragic. He was one of the wealthiest men in the world in his time. And he did all these wonderful things for people. And the things were good. They ate when they didn't have food. The kids got milk, it was good. But it didn't do him any good. Doing righteous is not the same as being righteous. And we're righteous only because God gives us his righteousness. When we trust Christ with all our hearts that we, we can do good and it counts and it pays. It, it's not some deception, self-deception. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you for your perfect righteousness. Thank you that no matter what we feel or how we fail, it stands forever. We thank you the cross of Christ is complete, perfect work for us. We praise you, we bless you, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. With the sound of the strings, symbols and heart, we praise you, we praise you. With the timbrel and dance, and shouts to you.